Very good. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we are uh, we're going to start off in just a few moments. My name is Ali Velshi. I'm from Al Jazeera Media Networks. I'm a host at Al Jazeera America. And it is my honor today to uh, be moderating this remarkable discussion on a topic that is probably one of the foremost of our time. It keeps getting bumped out of the news by, by things that are uh, more sensational. But in fact, it is the underpinning of uh, how our societies get built and how our populations prosper and grow. The, the issue of infrastructure, and in particular, the, the financing of the infrastructure gap. Now, if you are not fully versed on that, you will have something akin to a PhD in it by the time we're finished. Um, but let me just tell you how this is going to work. This is a televised debate, which means it will be streamed live. Uh, lots of people can, can watch this. This will also air on uh, various Al Jazeera uh, television platforms. As such, I have a little bit of homework to do. Uh, at the end of this, I won't do it at the front end, but there are just a couple of things I have to do that make it into the magic of television. So I will ask you uh, that when I'm finished, it, it would do me a great service if you didn't all just get up and run out until I finished with the few pieces of TV magic that I have to do. I basically do the, you know, the introductions and coming up and here's our, uh, here's our advertising or whatever the case is. There's just a couple of little things that'll take us just a few minutes, but I would ask you that unless you have to make a serious trip to the, uh, the restroom, uh, hang out for just a couple of minutes. Uh, it won't be long, I promise you. This debate will be, or this discussion, I won't really call it a debate because uh, uh, it may. And by the way, if any of you would like to make it a debate, feel free. Um, but this discussion will last an hour. Probably uh, in, in, the, in the few minutes prior to the ending of it, maybe 10 minutes or so, I'm going to open this up to questions from you, the audience, which we welcome. We really want you to ask your questions. Um, I would ask you this, however. Uh, this is a very, very smart topic, so, and I imagine if you've all chosen to be here, you had other choices, that would mean you're all uh, fairly smart folks. Um, I'm hoping that you will limit the degree to which you demonstrate that smartness when asking your question. Um, I, I often refer to uh, the World Economic Forum as, the, as an intellectual Olympics of sort. Uh, do not feel like you are performing when you're answering, asking your question. What we, what we need more than your credentials and the numerous papers you've written on the topic uh, is, a, is a good, concise, hard-hitting question that will elicit a response from uh, either whichever of my guests you'd like to hear from or, or all of them. Uh, I always find the questions here to be fantastic from you, and I always think, what a waste. I just spent 50 minutes asking my own questions, and you all have better ones. So I just ask for your cooperation on that front. And I think with that, that takes care of all the housekeeping. Uh, if we're all ready to go, I'll just ask my uh, friends in the control room. They're speaking to me in this little thing. So if you wonder who I'm talking to, uh, it's not my imaginary friend. I do have real friends who are talking to me in my ear. Uh, so I will ask my real friends in my ear. Uh, does that allow us to begin this conversation? <clears throat> Very good. I want to invite uh, you all to participate with me in this morning's discussion here at the World Economic Forum in Switzerland. The conversation we are having today is about bridging the infrastructure gap, the infrastructure financing gap in particular. Now, it is a remarkably important topic, uh, although many people won't understand uh, why there is an infrastructure gap. There has been a remarkable change in the way we finance infrastructure product, uh, projects in the world. Uh, over the last several years. Some of it has had to do with the recession that this world felt uh, and the, the degree to which banks will get involved in infrastructure issues. But as we will hear from our panelists, many of these issues are country specific. They are specific to the way in which governments have, uh, have handled infrastructure projects, the way they've gone, the delays they've experienced, the cost overruns, and the legal issues. And what we are trying to determine today is the best practices around the world that allow us to enjoy our built environments in a way where we can all prosper, where our societies can create more jobs, where we can become competitive with other countries and attract businesses to our own shores, where we can share uh, transportation and communication <clears throat> modalities uh, and, and allow everyone to enjoy a better standard of living. These are problems that are different depending on where you live in the world. In the developed world, uh, there are challenges and constraints which often revolve around politics, 
uh, in getting things done. In the developed world, there is a cry for improvements to infrastructure. So we have representation across the board here. I have asked my, uh, my guests today uh, not to necessarily start off with some introductory comments because I want to enjoy the debate between them. But I do want to uh, start on my left, your right, with the former uh, Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, Gordon Brown, who has headed this initiative at the World Economic Forum to figure out the best practices around the world and, and share this information with members. For my audience, sir, who may not be all that clear on what this problem is when it comes to financing infrastructure, what is the problem? Well, there are millions of people around the world who, without electricity, without the ability to travel, uh, without hospitals, without schools, without water, or they have inadequate provision because we failed to bridge what we call the infrastructure gap. And that is at least a trillion dollars every year that should be being spent on building not just hospitals and schools, but building power plants and building roads and rails and improving the condition of these. And what we've realized is, as a result of the economic crisis, governments do not have the money that they might have had in the past. We know that the banks uh, are conditioned by new rules and regulations. So we have got to look for better ways where the public and private sector, instead of fighting each other, are working with each other to deliver new infrastructure. And we have got to find innovative ways of financing infrastructure that yield returns to investors, but get the projects that we want up and running built quickly. Because one of the problems is long delays, inadequate returns, bureaucratic inefficiencies, lack of experience in the public sector, lack of benchmarking of countries that are doing well and badly, as well as the perceived risks that sometimes are exaggerated by those people who are potential investors. And as a, uh, a politician, there's an element that you have to deal with in terms of what the public perceptions are of infrastructure. So we have some countries where people will vote for somebody who says, I'll give you the infrastructure you need. I mean, we're going to be speaking about India in just a few yeah. moments. And you'll, you'll be in some countries, particularly some Western countries, where people associate infrastructure projects with government inefficiency, with waste, with, um, with trying to buy votes. Uh, what do we have to do to get people on board with the idea that this will cost money? But it's yeah, necessary. Yeah, people have got to know that at some point, uh, whether it's uh, paying for a, a road or a railway or paying for energy, uh, the bills have got to be met. And investors will not come in, and we need these investors unless they know there's a return. But there are more efficient ways that we can devise to deliver infrastructure. We've got to help with project preparation, which is also expensive as well as time consuming. We've got to underpin the, um, the loan facilities that are potentially available from investors, sometimes by guarantees from governments in difficult situations. And we've got to make the public sector more efficient, and it needs more expertise to enable it uh, to uh, work successfully with the private sector. But the, the opportunities are immense because the need is great. There is no shortage of capital or savings around the world, uh, and there is no shortage of need. But what we haven't done is produce the bankable projects. If you think of the gap as a trillion dollars and think of it in practical terms, that's perhaps a thousand projects of a billion dollars that could be being built now. Power stations, uh, water uh, improvement, uh, hospital schools, but of course roads, rail and other, and other transport. And of course uh, developments in IT and communications as well. So these are the projects that should be being built now. And there's an economic argument as well because we talk about secular stagnation around the world, and that's basically a problem of demand in the world economy. Uh, we have low interest rates. This is the time to invest in infrastructure as long as we can get the right balance between public and private sectors. You've spoken of many things that uh, are at play on the ground in India. Arundhati Bhattacharya heads uh, the State Bank of India. Uh, these are all issues you have heard. Uh, if you are going to have a, a conversation about infrastructure around the globe, Every single challenge in that realm faces you in India. Uh, from 2007 to 2013, Indian banks and financiers lent $153 billion to private corporations for roads, ports, power, telecommunication, railways. This is according to JB, JP Morgan. But you had cost overruns and delays, and in some cases, um, what appears to be an unfair system at which the, during which the contractors were chosen so the mood had soured 
over infrastructure. So India is desperate for it because you're urbanizing at a remarkable rate. People need this infrastructure, and yet you're facing a world where investors don't want to jump into it. Talk to me about that. Yes, uh, if you look at India today, uh, we have about a million youngsters joining the work stream every month. So we are talking 10 to mil 12 million jobs a year that needs to be created. No way we can do this unless we have the right kind of infrastructure, be they power, be it transport, be it communication networks, urbanization. We have a challenge on all fronts. And all of these are something that we have got to get in a short period of time if you are to ensure that the aspirations of our young generation is completely met. Now, if you look at India, we did realize quite early on that this is required. And from the year 2002, 2003, we started on the experiment of the public-private partnerships, the PPP projects. But again, what happened was that a number of mistakes were made. Uh, there were questions regarding the doling out of natural resources. There were questions regarding transparency. There were delays regarding uh, environmental clearances and land acquisition. And in fact, anything that could go wrong with these projects did go wrong. And as a result, we saw the kind of impact that we had from 2007 to 2013. As you said, the mood soured, uh, projects became unviable. There were huge cost and time overruns. And today, of course, as a result of all of that, the banking sector, which has been the main financier of this growth, they are sitting with quite a bit of stressed assets. But I think, you know, India is currently at the crossroads. We have realized that a number of mistakes have been made. And I think the new government that has come in, it has come in solely on the platform of growth. Their mandate is to ensure that India grows. So we have had a democracy, a very fractious and raucous democracy, vote for one person and one party, because I think the country as a whole realized that the only way we are going to get out of the poverty trap is if we get in better growth and better infrastructure. Towards that end, therefore, this government has been looking at how they can get projects that are better framed, how they can give single window clearances, and not only that, how they can get in more and more agencies to participate in the funding. Again, as I said, you know, the funding earlier was being done by commercial banks. Commercial banks had 10-year money, and therefore projects that were for 30-year assets, we were asking them to repay in all of eight or nine years. Now, this meant all the repayments were front-ended. As a result, projects got stressed in case there were time and cost overruns. Also, the people who actually promoted the projects couldn't take out any equity for going on to the next project. So a fellow who built a road couldn't take out money in order to go on to the next road. So what he did was he would pledge the shares of his original company and bring that in as equity for the next project, thereby leveraging, over-leveraging the balance sheet. I think these are things that are now all well documented. We realize all of it. So changes are being made in the financing models. Changes are being made by the government in ensuring that the projects are better prepared and the clearances come up front. As for the promoters as well, they also have realized that they cannot spread themselves too thin. And they need to get in a lot more equity to see these projects come to an end. So I think in India, we really are at the crossroads. But having said that, because today we have the three things of demand, demography, and democracy, I think we are uniquely positioned to take advantage and get on with the infrastructure bill that we need. Although the speed at which India needs to do this and the need is so great that we don't, That's there's right. not a lot of room for error, but if it, if it all I goes well. Agree. Peter Sands from Standard Chartered, you are one of those banks that has historically been very involved in infrastructure. You operate in many of these countries. Uh, we're going to speak in a moment about Africa. Standard Chartered has been very, very involved in Africa. Tell me traditionally where banks have been in terms of the degree to which they finance large infrastructure projects and why that has pulled back uh, to the degree that it has. Well, let me step back a bit and build on the comments of both um, Gordon and Owen Dutty. Um, the good news is that, well, start with the bad news. The bad news is there is a big gap um, and there's a massive need for infrastructure and we're not filling it nearly as well as we should be. The good news is, is that the money is there and that the levers that need to be pulled to get the money into the right places to invest in the projects are ones that are sort of in our control. And that somewhere in the world you can almost 
always find somebody who has solved that problem already. The difficulty is we haven't disseminated that widely enough. Um, I would break down the problem into two different parts. One is, are the projects investable? And that normally means two things. Are the risks of getting it executed manageable? Um, will it be built on time and to cost? And then secondly, are the ongoing running economics going to yield a return to the investors? If you have positive answers to both those questions, you've got an investable project. The challenge for most investors and most banks is that most of the projects we see, the answer to one of those questions is no. Um, um, and not deliberately no, it's often that the bits haven't been put together in a way that makes these projects investable. There's a second set of problems, which is around the way the financial system works in the post-crisis world. And there's no doubt that it has been made more difficult. For good reasons, the degree of maturity mismatch in bank balance sheets ha has come down. Um, uh, so banks borrow short and lend long, um, but we borrow less short and we lend less long. And that's a problem when you come to financing infrastructure um, than we did before um, the crisis. And so getting long-dated money, and this is building on Aronetti's point, into long-dated projects is more of a challenge than it used to be. But that's a solvable problem. Um, um, if we work with the uh, participants in the financial markets who have naturally long-dated liabilities, pension funds and so on, sovereign wealth funds, um, we can act um, as intermediaries to get that investment uh, into the projects. I actually think that bit of it is solvable. The, first, the, the bit that's really difficult is getting projects into investable shape. If you can get the projects into... And our problem is, I mean, we are financing a lot of infrastructure in Africa, a lot of power infrastructure. The problem is not getting the money. The problem is the work needed to get those projects into investable shape. This is a... OK, like, and this is the crux of the matter. It's also the part that... that many people won't understand. What does that mean? We have things that have to be done, rails, roads, energy that have to be built. They are expensive, they are big, and they sometimes take a long time and run into cost overruns. And everybody has so far said, money's not the issue. Making them into investable projects is the issue. I'm going to turn to Thierry Dio. Uh, you've been responsible for many major projects, and, and you've, you've, you've really spoken to this, both the idea of matching long-term projects with investors who have long-term horizons and taking them out of the realm of people who have short horizons, and at the same time, making projects investable. What does that mean, making projects investable? It's actually doing them, and this is what we typically do. So really, when we think about investing in infrastructure, I think you have to change the way of looking at it. Investing is not a financial exercise. Investing in infrastructure is integrating finance, policies, engineering, management, and also communities. And if you can integrate all that, then you can make project investable. Yes, there is a gap on the capacity of governments in order to deliver uh, infrastructure, but the private sector also has to bridge that gap by bringing their own capacity. So the way we look at investment in infrastructure is really integrating all these different things. You cannot just be a financer and not engage with the communities on the long term and not engage with the contractors and the engineers to really figure out what is the best infrastructure and the best service you can deliver to the community. And clearly, the community of investors that are looking for infrastructure are very long-term investors. I mean, we, we have a population of investors that are looking to invest for 25 years. What are they looking for? They're looking to... And who are these people, by the way? These are pension funds these are and pension insurance companies, funds, as Peter said? Probably most of you have their pensions in the type of uh, investors that uh, invest the money in infrastructure. Whether you talk to the teachers of California, the, uh, the uh, civil servants of Sweden, or uh, uh, the national pension of Korea, they all want the same type of long-term investment. And for them, investing in public service, public infrastructure, under public-private partnerships. And this is the really key, important theme. But everyone has to bring their own block into this. 
I want to uh, invite uh, Claver Gatete into the conversation. He's the Minister of Finance and Economic Planning of Rwanda. But for purposes of this conversation, you're representing the entire continent of Africa. Uh, because uh, like India, it, it is uh, when you take Africa as a whole, it, it is a very large population. And like India, you face very, very similar concerns. Now, in, in Africa, the issue tends to be, uh, of all the infrastructure deficits that exist, Energy is by far the biggest. In sub-Saharan Africa, there's a very large population that has no access to energy that connects to a main, electricity that connects to a, a distributed system. Uh, and that is one of the issues. But there are many. Uh, and Rwanda has really dealt with tackling those basic infrastructure needs and broadband infrastructure, wireless infrastructure. Tell me how you have achieved financing on these fronts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, but I hope for the representing Africa, you consulted my president. Uh, that's a big promotion. He's here as well, so we'll, we'll speak to him as well. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, Please don't tell him I promoted you. Uh, no. <laughs> no, thank you very much. Uh, I, I really have been listening carefully because for us it's a learning process. Uh, this is what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. The challenge of infrastructure is so crucial because it's the biggest cost of any kind of investment in any country. We can talk about other methods we are using in terms of attracting investments and also promoting the trade, but if we don't address the issue of infrastructure, the transport, the energy, and other kind of infrastructure products, uh, really we cannot, it will take us a long time if we don't do this. And that's why in the case of Rwanda, uh, the infrastructure alone is taking a third of the budget a that almost offer almost every year. We realized that we needed, if you have to move fast, we needed infrastructure in the country. We need infrastructure linking our country to our neighbors so that we can be able to promote the trade. But we have had challenges on both sides because in the case of Rwanda, what we have from one of the biggest as, uh, cost, as you mentioned, uh, was uh, the one of energy. And the energy gap was really so huge that once you take that one into account, uh, it's a big cost for anybody who is investing. Uh, and what we did was really to have a dialogue with the private sector. Uh, the sources of energy in Rwanda, uh, usually the hydro, the pit uh, to power. Uh, we have the methane gas to power. We are now exploring also the geothermal. And we've had domestic, uh, the projects that are domestic in nature, but others also which are linking us with the region. Uh, for example, the uh, 80 million megawatts, which is linking us with Tanzania and Burundi. Uh, it's at the border. And also the one that we are working on now that is linking us to Burundi and DRC, uh, which is 147 megawatts, the C3 that we are working on. But also we have so many others that are more domestic in nature. What we realized is that actually we needed to, uh, the government alone can never be sufficient, the resources, your budget. Uh, it, can't, it can't be enough. So we tried to incentivize the private sector to go into the generation so that the distribution part is done by the government but providing as much information, as, well as much incentives to the private sector to be able to do the generation part. We found that that, that way then uh, it will be more sustainable. That's it for, for energy part. For the road transport, mainly the government has been borrowing to be able to fill that kind of gap. But now we are also talking to the uh, private sector to see how they can come in, especially for uh, the uh, toll roads, the road tolls, sorry, uh, which uh, where they can really be able to invest way ahead of time. And together, of course, uh, for others like airport, like other kind of infrastructure, we've been doing that. For the uh, technology of which the president really uh, has been leading in this, and knowing that we are a landlocked country with no much natural resources, the service sector is the one that is leading our economy. And to do that, the technology has been very, very crucial uh, into this. And that's why it was linked to our vision to make sure that we can have the total infrastructure. And now we have the total, almost the country covered. Uh, now we are moving to another level of 4G, LTE, which is yeah. going to be completed by the 2017, all over the country. The city is already covered uh, almost everywhere, uh, and we are moving to that. We are seeing that one contributing. Already we are getting the benefits of that, where we are seeing the whole service sector is being facilitated by the, uh, uh, by the IT. Actually, in our GDP, the, now the IT services itself three percent of GDP, which, wow. is, which is very helpful, which is above the, uh, uh, I think, uh, the Africa standard. But then for the uh, regional level, it was challenging. We've had so many experiments where we, we belong to the East African community, together with Tanzania, with Kenya, with Uganda, and Burundi. 
But then when we wanted to just have infrastructure linking uh, the entire region, we started with an experiment of Northern Corridor. And here, my colleague, uh, the governor of the Central Bank of Kenya, is, is right here, has been also partly involved in this, where we are trying to see how do we make sure that we move the goods back and forth uh, from our own countries to the border, especially for us who are landlocked. One of the focus areas uh, was actually uh, um, uh, was the railway. And when it came to the railway from Mombasa uh, in Kenya to Uganda, and then to Rwanda, and later on to Burundi and the neighboring countries, we realized that the cost was too heavy, over 13 billion. How do we finance that? We cannot go and borrow as countries, uh, neighboring countries, to, st to finance this. Uh, otherwise, we wouldn't finance anything else. So what the heads of state uh, agreed on uh, directing us is that actually we should have an infrastructure levy. <coughs> So now we are 1.5% of, uh, of our own imports is infrastructure levy, so that we could have our own part of contribution to that without, uh, um, uh, without disturbing the usual developments that we have in our own countries. But then Who we is that levied on? Oh, imports. Imports. Yeah, 1.5% okay. of imports. And so it does have the effect of causing imported goods to become more expensive to Rwandans. No, no, no but yeah, but we are selecting somehow, as, as I mentioned, uh, because we want to make it cheaper. It has already been more expensive because you are using the road. Got it. Once we go to this one here, it will become cheaper. Got it. And that's why you have to have a, uh, an, a finance that is going to help us in a more sustainable way, where you can borrow against this kind of fund and be able to bring in the private sector. But I think, as many people, Gordon Brown and uh, um, the Sons, have, have mentioned, you really cannot do it alone. There has to be private sector. One thing that you mentioned, which is very, very crucial, is you can do all the studies and come and say, oh, this is viable. But that's not enough, for, at least from our own experience. We had to hire the Africa 50 uh, and a company that was put in place by the Africa Development Bank and say, can you help us? Can you just study the economics mm -hmm. on this mm -hmm. in as much as there are feasibility studies? And then <coughs> cater for the needs of the private investors. This is a big deal, uh, as we have all spoken about, we've, we've alluded to. And I want to ask Uva Kruger about this. Uva is, is part of the largest design architecture and engineering firm, in one of the largest ones in the world, the largest in Europe. Uh, the issue of viability, the issue of, as Peter Sand says, will it be built? And will it be built to cost? And what is the sustainability? What is the return on that investment? You spoke about the Africa Development Bank, the idea that you need that technical expertise to say, this isn't just a political project that gets votes in a particular region by somebody who's running for government. Will this actually work and pay back? And that is something you're responsible for helping uh, countries and projects do. I think these are very, very important aspects. Probably for, for the sake of simplicity, let me just um just to remind all the audience, what we are talking about is not only a subject for the developing world, but if you look at uh, the average status of infrastructure in the US, whoever has uh, driven a car and a road in New York and California, uh, you might have been a little bit worried crossing a bridge there. We just, we and, just lost a bridge in, in this last week. And, and in the UK, let's be clear, we still have a Victorian rail architecture, and we are now talking about le electrification, and the country has taken quite a while. So, so the, the subject we are talking about uh, is, a, is a really worldwide one, and it is about the, the question of making an investment case. Uh, um, and there are, also let's face it again, there are only three sources of money at the end of the day. We call it the three T's in, in infrastructure. It's either taxes, or it's tariffs, or it's transfer of some kind of private money. And these are the three sources we are talking about. Where we are not doing a good job uh, as, as the industries that are involved in infrastructure, construction, engineering, is providing certainty with regard to the revenue streams which are coming out of infrastructure assets, and providing certainty with regard to the cost of construction. And if these two cases are made in a thorough way, then I agree with Peter, money is not the issue. But to make this connection and to make it, as the minister said, in a way that not only at the beginning the feasibility study is done in a thorough, in a thorough fashion, but then also during the construction that constantly during the implementation of infrastructure, cost consciousness and, and uh, the maintenance cycle of the infrastructure that is being put in place is top of the agenda. Only that guarantees at the end that we don't have cost overruns. Uh, which we typically had in the past, 
and that this feasibility, this investment case, remains <coughs> to be intact towards the end of the construction phase. You, you've the been good news, in... let, me, let me just yeah. add two things. The good news is twofold. First of all, more and more governments, as we see uh, with the example of Rwanda, hiring capable engineering consultancy firms all the way through. Uh, Qatar is another example with the central planning office, um, which helps the Qatari government in managing that. Second, technology helps us. Because now we are not talking only about a physical asset that is being constructed. We are having a digital asset as well of the infrastructure that is being put in place, which allows us to do scenario planning. How can we do it more cost efficiently? How can we do value engineering? How can we reduce maintenance costs at the end of the day? And that is key to help to make the investment case in the long run. Let me ask you, Gordon Brown. Um, just as the minister does not feel like representing all of Africa, I am officially not here to represent the United States, but I will tell you that in the United States, politicians are absolutely 100% the problem in moving forward on infrastructure. 100%. In fact, might be 120%, although I, I don't think that's mathematically sound. In the world, when all of what we're talking here is about good planning, technological yep. expertise, the third runway at, at Heathrow, I mean, it's an airport I avoid now, because that third runway, they've been talking about it for, I had hair when they started talking about it. <laughs> we actually decided to build it, and then it was canceled. And that's one of the problems. You have changes of governments, you have changes of policy, you have people wanting to change the regulatory rules, and then you have, of course, administrative uh, inefficiencies. And certainly you do have political calculations. I mean, someone said that a politician was someone who promised to build a bridge even when there was no river. <laughs> and there is some uh, truth in the idea that these are prestigious projects that people announce and then don't bother to do the work to make, make them actually uh, happen. I would say that uh, we pioneered in Britain uh, public-private partnerships. I think we learned a huge amount about the inefficiencies in the public sector that had to be dealt with to make these uh, viable uh, for the future. I think that experience uh, tells me that there are ways that we can construct private-public partnerships that are beneficial both to the public sector and the private sector. And you see the two problems that Uvi and, uh, and Peter were raising. Uh, is there a return? You've got to answer that question. And is the risk too great? Uh, and therefore, you've got to find a way of mitigating the political, the regulatory, the, um, sometimes the currency risks, uh, other risks that make people feel that a project is too difficult to, to contemplate. Now, I think uh, a proper relationship between the public and private sector, and this often includes the international institutions, can help mitigate some of the risk. I think that the advances that we've made in discussing project preparation facilities because remember, the upfront costs of doing projects are very high, perhaps 10% on average of the cost of a project, but there is no return for any of that period of time. So we've got to find a way of defraying some of the project preparation costs. And again, public-private partnerships can help here. And we need to do more to, to underpin the, the debt and, and uh, credit that has got to be issued to get, to get the projects underway. So I think you've got to break these problems down into specific problems. Of course, there are sectoral difficulties. And of course, there are different country uh, experiences. Uh, and you need to benchmark each country, I think, over time. And the World Economic Forum, which benchmarks competitiveness, ought to benchmark the efficiency of countries in dealing with the provision of infrastructure and the setting up of partnerships. But if you can break the problems down into specific issues that have got to be addressed, and I think Uwe and Peter were, mm -hmm. uh, were, were suggesting that, then you can actually solve this problem and get projects underway. And I think the more the discussion goes to w w what are the barriers to project preparation, uh, what are the difficulties about delays, what are the problems about the efficiency of the public sector in individual countries? Uh, and then how can you construct a more effective public-private partnership? I think we could make a lot of progress. And what's interesting in the last year, and i just finish on that, is that you now have uh, a new facility uh, in the, from the G20, an infrastructure knowledge bank. You've now got a number of project preparation facilities from the regional development banks. And you've now got the big Asian initiative, the BRICS initiative, and a World Bank initiative to try to provide public finance, and if not finance, public guarantees and public expertise, and the expertise to help get yep. the projects moving. So big momentum now at a time when, as I keep saying, interest rates are low, 
uh, the potential exists to move. This may be the best quicker. time in, in, Abs in our history to do this. Absolutely. And of course, the need in America and Europe, as well as in right. the emerging markets, is obvious. So Arundhati, you heard when we were talking in, in the green room, I, I told you I've recently gone to India. Mm -hmm. uh, and on my third visit to the consulate for my visa, I mentioned to the fellow, didn't you know that, that Modi wants to streamline this whole thing? So when you mentioned single window approvals for, uh, for uh, big projects, I wonder uh, when that's going to happen. But um, I'll tell you that land acquisitions, for instance, on transportation, right? The idea that you need to uh, acquire land to lengthen a road or widen a road has run into to big problems in India. There was an understanding that if you, in, in one case, with this pink uh, city expressway, that you had four-fifths or 80 percent of the land and the other 20 would come and it didn't come. Um, do you feel sometimes that you'd rather be a government official in China? <laughs> <laughs> well, not really. I think we quite enjoy Nothing wrong with the, the Chinese, I'm uh, just saying. We, we quite enjoy being a Rakas democracy, as I said. But having said that, I think, you know, the government is well seized of this problem. Uh, it's like this, in respect of land, the government has just come with an ordinance to try and fix the kind of issues that had stopped land acquisition altogether. I think in India, the good thing is that if you really focus on a problem, we are able to do that project in a very, very cost-efficient manner. If you look at the Mars project, uh, the, what the Prime Minister keeps saying, and it's a fact, the per kilometer cost of that Mars project was less than if you took a taxi ride across Delhi. <laughs> okay, so if you look at our uh, medical infrastructure, we have some of the best medical tourism, again, because we are able to deliver it at very reasonable costs. If you look at the recent financial inclusion project that the government had taken up, whereby they had said that every household must have one bank account. And this has been accomplished in a matter of five months by banks like us at very, very minimal costs. Now, the fact of the matter is that if you put everybody together and they're focused on a particular objective, I think in India we can get it done. We have actually been quite frugal in our uh, usage of capital. We are one of those countries where we have not had investment-led growth. So to that extent, we have not really been very, uh, you know, we have not really been wasting capital a lot. But I think what I wanted to ask Mr. Sands was that you said that it is necessary to match long-term money with long-term usage. I fully agree with you. But in India, the problem that we are facing currently is the fact that long-term money traditionally belongs to the pension funds and the insurance funds. Now, in India itself, the pension funds, they are interested in putting money only in sovereign debt. Reason being, we don't have a social security network, and people are afraid of risk. And therefore, the government also is not mandating that the pension funds get into things like infrastructure bonds. Now, given that, this, that being the situation internally, if we look at pension funds abroad, and these are funds that are looking for yield, the yield in India would be good. But there again, I think the problem that is preventing them from coming in is the fear of depreciation. And if you work in a hedging cost of 6 to 7% or more, then really speaking, the returns that we are going to give is not enough. So really speaking, I think, you know, we need to get across this particular one issue before we can see that kind of long-term funding coming in. Because without that long-term funding, the banks that are sitting with mature projects are not able to let these projects go so that they can take up the next round of financing. Mm -hmm. This is a good I, point. Yeah. I, I just didn't want, maybe the, for the sake of the audience, there's a point that you mentioned by uh, Prime Minister that, that I thought was very, very crucial from our own experience. One, first of all, you have to get the project off the ground. And there has to be private sector coming in. They have a lot of issues. Some of them you've mentioned. The land issues, the environment issues, the laws that maybe are likely to change tomorrow, where they need predictability. The issues, uh, there are quite so many issues. For, and if it is cross-border, it means, how about the legal system that is helping me in terms of cross-border? And then, for example, if you are talking about the railway, what is going to happen on the road that can give me the assurance? So in other words, there is a whole checklist of questions that the people are asking themselves, apart from saying the project is viable. Now, the project uh, preparation would be able to address all those kind of issues, to give guarantees that actually all these risks, whether they are economic, whether they are social, whether they are political, they are being handled. And that way then, they can talk on how to move forward on uh, now in the implementation. And then you go to the next stage of saying, 
How about the resources? Yes, there are many funds, including sovereign wealth funds. There are pension funds and others who could come in. But they should come in when everything has been settled. And that's where we have the big issues, whereby this, uh, we've been, the way the tradition we have been doing it is that uh, actually we put the project there and say, it is viable. I'm looking for people to come in. But actually, there are so many concerns from what you have seen, which are very, very crucial. And I think also another thing that lacks is uh, where are the leaders? In our case, we are lucky that in East Africa, the presidents were the ones leading, giving assurances on this, because they know the impact on the economic development. And also, the other kind of cooperation apart from the leaders is, as uh, Gordon Brown mentioned, you go to the World Bank, uh, they have the global infrastructure facility. You go to ADB, you go to others, they all have these kind of resources. How do they work together? And together with the national governments and the region, for example, in East Africa, in our case, or Rwanda, to come together and be able to see how do we address this? For example, in the World Bank alone, we had to figure out of saying, it's not you giving us money, but come with uh, IFC, come with MIGA, come with others, so that they address all the components of the risks which the private sector really uh, care about. Mm -hmm. If you can manage to really have the proper preparation in a coordinated manner, if you have the leadership of those countries or regions really coming in, and then you have addressed all the concerns of the private sector, it means the project can take off, no matter how big it is, and the financing could be available. But then the starting point is getting it right, as the Prime Minister mentioned. Yeah. Yeah. Peter? And by the way, this, uh, this issue of currency fluctuation is a big deal. I, uh, although, I wonder why Russians and Greeks are not financing American developments in that case, because, uh, because it's a safer bet. But, but it's a good concern. Um, I think one of the things that's coming out of this discussion is actually the financing um, issue um, needs to be disaggregated somewhat. The financing of the preparatory phase is one issue. The financing of the build phase is a second issue with a second set of risks. And then there's the financing of the ongoing piece of infrastructure once it's up and running and generating a yield. And one of the complexities here is that you need different participants with different concerns at different stages in there. And the problem with this is if you can't stitch it all together, it tends to collapse on the weakest link. Because I don't want to finance the preparatory phase if I don't think there's money coming in for the build or I don't think it's sustainable um, on the ongoing. I've got to believe that the other bits of it, otherwise I'm going to end up with something that isn't going to um, uh, pay back. There is a big issue, as Arundhati said, about the way pension funds are set up, skilled and regulated in many markets. Um, in some places, and Canada is probably, or Sweden are probably leading examples, you have pension funds that actually have the capabilities to invest in infrastructure in other parts of the world, and they have the resources, the understanding, the analytics to be able to manage that kind of risk. Most pension funds in most parts of the world are miles away from being in that place, and even if they were, their regulators wouldn't let them. Um, and, and so we do have a fundamental problem, because you're not going to finance long-term infrastructure in its ongoing phase through a bank balance sheet. That just doesn't work um, either. Um, and so there are a, a, a number of sort of market-driven and regulatory issues that have to be kind of unpicked and sorted out to make the financing of the different phases um, work. But I don't want us to be um, negative here. I actually think this is really exciting because the prize, we may not get all of Gordon's trillion, but even if we make a big dent in Gordon's tri trillion, the prize in terms of economic growth and job creation, in terms of human welfare, health, education, and so on, is a, is a massive prize. And it isn't like we're, we're dealing with solvable problems here. When we're not trying to solve some mathematical problem that hasn't been solved or discover some molecule that hasn't been discovered. The, the essence of the answer to every bit of these problems has been done somewhere. Um, and so if we can pick it out and stitch the things together and make them work, um, we can do this. Um, and the thing that we find, what we increasingly find ourselves doing, is actually the money we put on the table from our balance sheet is almost the least of the value we add. The value we add is helping work with the government, with the international organizations, with pension funds, with other, um, with the construction companies and so on to understand their concerns and just try and help stitch the thing together. Because if you can get those three phases in a coherent mm -hmm. way, and you've got the right kind of parties involved, then, you, then you've got it. Then you can make it work. And it's an enormously exciting thing to make that happen.
Yeah, I'd like to put a positive spin because I, don't, I think the risk perception is way beyond what it is. So uh, there's a tendency to sort of blame it all and say government get ready and prepare it and get it all ready so we can invest. Uh, I don't think this is the case. In fact, it takes two parties to tango and infrastructure is a dynamic process and you need the private sector to actually engage a bit more in that phase. Yes, you need project preparation, but if I give you an ex a simple example, Turkey had a 10 billion euro program for healthcare that they launched three or four years ago. They awarded all this contract about two years ago and they said, oh, now build it. And, and of course, didn't happen. Uh, what we did uh, was going to see them and bring in on board the EBRD, the Regional Development Bank, and say, we can discuss for six months about how you make a proper contract that is investable. They're happy to listen. They're happy to take on the comments. They made the contract investable. On the same side, we talked to the contractor, brought him in there, and say, you have to put your money where your mouth is. We need a guarantee that you will deliver on time, on budget. And we've also done the work on the environmental side and the communities. And last year, we were able to close the first project in Adana, which is close to the Syrian border in all places. Uh, for Turkey, 1,500 beds that will change the entire city. A and this is the work that, and I'm working on behalf of investors, so those people are willing to do so. so this is not such an aversion uh, to risk uh, in infrastructure. It's really the way that we engage. And I really welcome those initiatives that have been done at the G20, the hub, uh, the project preparation. But we also have to put our part. And that is why last year we launched this long-term infrastructure investor association to really engage with government on a number of things. One is sustainability. Uh, and how do we share be best practice between public, private, public and public, private and private sector on those type of things. The other thing is creating a benchmark for infrastructure, making it no longer an invisible asset class, but a real one that people can actually refer to and then understand if I'm a pension fund from South Dakota, whatever, uh, I can actually have a benchmark and invest in infrastructure in India, in Europe, in Africa, in a way that I can compare it and then when I go to my CIO, I don't get shot because I have no benchmark. Right. Because this is usually what happens. And, and, and so this work has to come from both sides. And the whole purpose of the association, which has been really founded with long-term-minded investors, people like Allianz, all the people with the big pockets, uh, is really there to build that private sector understanding and collaboration and break to the system because it, it, it can't be just the government dealing with project preparation and it's not only a question of money. I mean, just as a bracket on that, even project preparation, even with billions, you will still not make it if people don't focus on training engineers to put them in administrations. You know, what is the biggest problem in most countries in Africa when you want to launch an infrastructure project? The president says, I want it, everybody want it. You get all the parties behind it. And they say, okay, who's gonna project manage this? You need somebody who knows technical, you know, somebody who knows financial that can have a financial advisor, somebody who knows the legal side to understand the legal framework, and somebody who knows everything else. So you need that <clears throat> five-legged sheep to come and be dropped into this and be responsible for delivery. And unless 10 years before you actually had people coming out in engineering school and training in the government that are there to do that, you can give them billions, so it's not gonna happen. So there are a number of layers. Obviously, policy has to go in a deeper level in terms of capacity building for administration, which is, to me, the big, really peace to actually allow the money for project preparation to become efficient. Uva, hang on one second. I just want to uh, let the, uh, the folks here in our uh, audience, uh, yeah, that's exactly what I want you to do. Put up your hand if you have a question. We have mics here. I'm going to get that mic to you, but for the moment, I'm going to just have uh, Uva make a quick comment. Just one, one uh, addition to that was what Jerry said. Besides the fact that you need to get this general approach right on a specific project, there's the need for a much more holistic view on 
how that project, be it, um, let's say, uh, a desalination plant or be it a piece of infra transport infrastructure, fits in to the whole development of an urban environment. So to put it very simply, it doesn't help if you get uh, uh, all ducks in a row with regard to a desalination plant, but you don't have the energy next door to operate it. And even more so, our responsibility from a World Economic Forum perspective goes beyond that. It's not only the the physical infrastructure, it's also the social infrastructure that has to be cohesive for people actually being in an environment, being capable of using it. So education comes, uh, comes with that. And, and there's, a, there's an additional dimension to it, which I would call a holistic approach to infrastructure development in urban centers, which we also have to take into account. Very good. We have a question over there. My name is Ahmed Hekel. Um, uh, I, I hear a number of comments that are very nice. Uh, uh, um, capital, uh, frugal, frugality, I hear do it on time. Uh, I hear uh, uh, does it make money, does it return there. But the problem with many of those projects is once they are got done, they got done financed by ECAs. And ECAs, one, invariantly, they come in and they say we want a contractor from one of our own countries. And sometimes this pushes the price up and sometimes it does not meet, meet, uh, meet the herd returns. Do you have any comment on that? Who'd like to take that? I can comment mm -hmm. on that if you want. But yeah. uh, I mean, I, I think this most ECAs pretty much drop these policies. And I can find you a number of examples. Turkey is one uh, where you have a number of bilateral institutions like ECAs that are financing either local contractors or contractors not from their country. So mm -hmm. I think this, is, this wave is behind us. Mm -hmm. uh, it's almost yesterday's story, the ECAs. And that mm -hmm. also has to do with the fact Let that me... the local contractors have become much mm -hmm. more capable mm -hmm. in most countries in this world, where you still see international expertise and rightfully so is on the PMC side or the project management side. And I think that's, that's a good thing. But on the contracting side, typically that is being provided locally. I'm going to ask the gentleman, can you give that the mic back to the gentleman? You, you, you seem to heartily disagree with this. You've done nothing but shake your head in the answer. I, I, Is there something I, I, on your I, mind I, that I, you... I vehemently disagree. I, I don't disagree. I vehemently disagree. If you, if you take, uh, you know, the Chinese uh, ECAs, if you take many other... Can somebody other tell my audience what an ECA okay. is? Uh, and export credit agencies. agencies. Thank you. So they, they, are, they finance their contractors to come into one of the countries to build a piece of infrastructure. And typically, that infrastructure costs much more than if you, you take it on the market. And that is especially true of Africa, because there is no other alternative. Okay. Let me ask, let me ask <laughs> our uh, finance minister from yeah. Rwanda about this. Thank you so much. You see, uh, I think we have to uh, differentiate the sources of money. Usually when the government is borrowing directly, if you are borrowing internationally, you have to tender and get the right person who meets the requirement. If it is very cheap money that is coming from some of the countries, then there are restrictions on saying, we can give you some cheaply, but then you have to use our companies. And here what we are talking about is actually mobilizing money globally where the private sector is involved. Whether it is the, uh, the equity or debt, the equity being maybe from other, like pension funds and others, uh, insurance money, global funds. Once you get into that kind of partnership, then that model is not the model that you have to use because it's not one government borrowing from one entity that has specific conditions on how to use their money. So that's why I'm saying it depends on the sources of money. And now that I still have the, 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 um, uh, uh, the space to speak, uh, to, to comment on what has just been said, one of the things really uh, which you mentioned, that uh, the banks usually have short money. They don't have very long-term resources. But as regulators, uh, I used to be one of them, uh, regulating the insurance and the pension, the only thing that you are looking for is that kind of risk. The, it, it does not prevent them from, for example, investing in the infrastructure bonds. No. It is saying, how much risk are you taking? And that risk is what determines what the regulator is looking at and, and determining whether or how much you are supposed to be investing. But for some of the projects, they could have a combination of several private sector coming in, and it would be possible even to get long-term resources. But it depends on how much government is involved, how much the private sector is involved. Governments would like the private sector to take on these projects and make the money, uh -huh. because they have other infrastructure projects uh, to go into. 
I think the world is changing. I think uh, our speaker is referring to restrictive practices, anti-competitive practices. I think we're getting closer to a global market. And I think what's significant about this discussion is that we now see that if you can bring together a partnership of the investors, the contractors, governments, regional development banks, international uh, agencies like the, the World Bank, you can actually do far more. And if we can find better ways of these working together, then we can so systematically solve the problems that make projects too risky. So you take uh, corruption risk. There, there are various ways of, of, of dealing with that. You take regulatory risk. There are various conditions that can be set down. You take political risk. Again, you can bind in, let's say, in Africa, the African Union and not just the government of a country as part of a project. Oh, yeah. uh, currency risk. Once you go through the various risks, and, and as, uh, as was said earlier by my friend from Meridian, the perceived risks what people perceive as the risks are greater than the actual risks, in my experience. But once you go through these uh, risks, you can actually deal with them on a systematic basis. But it does depend on this idea that it is partnership that is going to be the, the key to solving many of these problems. Very good. Thank you for uh, thank you not just for the question, but for so vigorously shaking your head so I knew it was coming yeah, on. No, no. Uh, I see a few hands here. Uh, let's start over here. Good morning, Barbara Novick. Um, you mentioned the need to match capital pools, pensions, insurers with the projects. Um, we couldn't agree more. How do you see the new tax initiatives that discourage cross-border investment and create problems for pooled vehicles impacting the infrastructure investing? Thank you very much. Uh, uh, who would like to handle this, Terry? I mean, I'm, I'm not quite sure which tax initiatives that you are mentioning. Who are you referring to specifically? Like Say that again. Base erosion project. What? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's really designed for multinationals yeah. and the, the tax jurisdiction gaming. Um, it spills over to infrastructure. I mean, what the problem has been solved in a way because even if you are a U.S pension fund, if you want to invest in Europe, you actually invest in a European vehicle. So therefore, you, you do have sort of bilateral issues on the tax, which are quite clear today. But I don't think we will see any sort of additional negative impact because of the way that investment in infrastructure become very local, even though the money may come from across the world, from Australia, from uh, Korea, or, or California. So. I, I don't see many uh, negative impacts from that. Peter Sands. Uh, the one comment I would make is I do think that infrastructure finance is very vulnerable to unintended consequences for, from regulatory or tax initiatives designed to achieve another perfectly justifiable uh, objective. Uh, I mean, tax is one aspect. Another good aspect is um, uh, long-term long derivatives. Um, a lot of regulatory pressure against long tenor derivatives because some of the excesses before the crisis were overstructured, um, overcomplicated derivatives. Unfortunately, if you want to do longer term project finance in rupees, you want to be able to hedge out the interest rate risk and currency risk. Uh, that, that's got a lot more expensive. Um, and do you really want the people who are borrowing the money to do it on an unhedged um, basis? Um, the, the, the fundamental issue here is that the distinguishing character of infrastructure finance is that it is long term. You put a big bit of money down first, and it takes a very long term to, time to get the money back. And the reason it's so sensitive is that small changes in the amount of risk magnified over a very long term can completely change the risk profile of um, the proposition. And also, the way you think, and that's why I think you often have issues of perception um, playing such a role, because people are trying to say, well, hang on, I, I like the government I'm facing at the moment, I like the regulatory regime, but what's the government 10 years from now going to think about the taxation yeah. or the tariffing or the, um, uh, uh, around this? Because actually the payoff on this project is, is in that period. And, and that's why I think infrastructure finance requires so much thought about the, the way projects are structured, the contractual, the tax, the legal <laughs> stuff um, around it because it is so long-term in nature. Uh, my, my experience of the years is that regulatory impact can be much far greater than tax issues. Yeah, I, I mean, right. the solvency too had a much more negative impact on 
long-term investors in insurance in particular, <coughs> investing in infrastructure rather than any of the tax madness that could have happened uh, post-crisis. So, I mean, how did they change Solvency II for infrastructure? We had to go and actually discuss benchmark with the European regulator to actually move them into considering infrastructure as long-term productive instrument that couldn't fall into the same category as hedge fund or over derivatives. So these major changes, and it wasn't targeting infrastructure when they were doing it, but if, if you come with the impact and the benchmark and the data to convince them, then they change their mind. Here we're actually now talking about the, the failures and inefficiencies of the public sector, and there's a huge amount I think could be done. I remember when President Mitterrand was president of France, he compared French railways to British railways, and he said he had high-speed travel from Paris to Calais, and then he crossed the channel and had a chance to have a leisurely look at the English countryside, <laughs> because we were so slow at, at building uh, infrastructure I I in Britain. And so what do you do about the, the, the public sector? I, I think you've got to have more expertise within it. Uh, I think you've got to have benchmarking of each uh, country, and I think the World Economic Forum could play a huge place in that, and that would test countries who want infrastructure projects on whether they've performed well in the past. I think in cases where you're worried about corruption, contracts could be signed outside the country, in London, New York, or wherever it was thought to be uh, better to do so. And then there is an issue that Peter's raised, which brings me back to this. Why do some infrastructure projects take so long? Mm. Uh, the delays... Uh, the hold-ups, and of course you need long-term finance because these are long-term projects, but the time it takes from the original conception to getting something up and running is far too long, and we've really got to work together. And again, this is a partnership because it cannot be solved just by the contractor because he's held back by planning permissions, and then he's held back by whether he's got the international agencies to give a guarantee. But we've got to find a way of doing these things quicker because when you see the need, and then you know it will take 20 years before you've actually got the project up and running. It's just not good enough. We've got to find a way of doing these things quicker. And that's political will and it's people working together to make it happen uh, a lot more quickly than most projects do. I'm going, to, I'm going to end up on that where we've run out of time, actually. We've gone a few minutes over, so I appreciate this. This could have been a, another uh, half an hour or an hour long discussion. I thank you to all of our panelists who've really made it very clear what the problems are that we're facing in the world. And I thank you, the audience here, for your fantastic questions. Uh, that's it for us uh, on behalf of Al Jazeera Media Networks and the World Economic Forum. I'm Ali Velshi. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.